Welcome to another video of an Aduro in the Aduro video series. In today's video, we will have uh, Ofer Vikas, who is the CEO of Aduro, and Mina Bichet, who is the CFO of Aduro, to go through um, investor presentation. And in tomorrow's video, uh, we will also have these two individuals along with Anil who is the chief scientist. And in tomorrow's video, we will focus more on the chemistry behind it. But today is just going to be just an, an overall presentation. So I'll give you guys a 10,000 foot view on, on the company. So we are Aduro Clean Technologies. We want to thank Madish, of course, for connecting us uh, with his members uh, to listen to the story here. We appreciate you taking the time. Um, what we do is basically we have developed the next generation chemical deconstruction uh, technology. Uh, what that means that we, you know, we call it a, a chemical deconstruction technology platform. And the word platform is quite important because it applies across several industries and applies across several sectors. We're going to focus um, primarily on one of the three uh, main areas or verticals that we work on. The first one being converting waste plastics into uh, oils that go into the manufacturing of new plastics, which is basically plastic recycling or chemical uh, plastic recycling. The second vertical is upgrading bitumen uh, into lighter oil, uh, which is higher value, and it eliminates in the operating expenses of adding diluent to ship oil or heavy oil uh, across pipelines. The third one is renewable oils into renewable fuels and specialty chemicals. Uh, the presentation is going to mainly be focused on just the plastic side of things. But, uh, you know, all three verticals are very much advanced on our end with more to come in, right? So there's applications outside of the three that we're mentioning right here. I'll pass it on to Ofer to go through the first, I want to say two thirds of the presentation. What we're going to do, we're going to jump around a little bit. We're going to tell you where we are right now, how we got here, and what we expect to do and deliver over the next little bit. With that, I'll pass it on to Ofer uh, to kind of jump start this presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Mario. And hi, everyone. Thank you for having us. Uh, this presentation, um, I'll show you. I'll share with you the idea and the concept, and uh, basically how we um, how we move it forward. I'd like Mina to jump uh, every now and then, Mina, when you feel free, don't wait until the end. You, you'll see that there may be missing part. We'd like to make sure that we're bringing every component that, you know, in your curiosity uh, home. So we will answer all the questions. And so Mina, if you feel something, just jump in. With that, I'll start. Uh, so Aduro is, uh, of course, uh, about uh, 10 years old, uh, been public in the uh, uh, since uh, last year. And I'll talk about it. This is the forward-looking statement that you are I'm sure all of you are aware uh, we are we have to bound by those thing regulations. This is the first time that uh, uh, we came out public um, and uh, about a year ago, if you you had no reason to listen to hear about us at all because we've been ten years, we've been spending ten years uh, under the radar doing our r and d. And the day before we become public, the website was up and running. Six months ago, uh, a writer from the Forbes came out and looked at what we've been doing. It was under NDA. We didn't pay for that. Uh, we made the full disclosure, and uh, he came up with two articles, the later one being us, describing us in details and explaining why we are uh, unique and doing uh, unique things. In this presentation, I'll talk about the technology a lot, so I'll move aside from that. Uh, I'll say that we are a rich IP company. Uh, we have um, uh, already to this day seven patents, and if you look uh, for a company that our age, 10 years old, seven patents is quite a lot. And that means within time we managed to increase and increase, increase our operation. That is understandable because we started with the heavy oil. We embedded from the heavy oil, we moved to the, into the renewable, and then we, uh, at this point of time, uh, are moving on the plastic. And lessons learned from one to the other help us to increase the things and i know it sounds a little bit uh, weird but that's what really happened and through the discussion of the presentation i'll tell you when i say ip rich i'm also meaning that we are in the house at that level that we are capable of talking to different organization about um let's say new design of food packaging if you will we have this know-how inside not that we're doing it right now but our uh, in IP or intellectual property is very, very rich because it contains uh, a wide range of applications. 
we have multiple market applications. The one that we're presenting here and the one that we're talking about is bitumen and renewable. This is the guys that we are promoting. Uh, more importantly, and the one that is right now on the discussion we will present you is the plastics, but there are others that you don't, we're not talking about. Uh, among our uh, tire rubbers, uh, recycle of tire rubbers, and the other one is uh, used engine oil. Vast amount of quantities are there, but we're just not touching it because the market is so big. Each market that we're dealing with is fairly large. Um, this is uh, just a, a slide to tell you that we are last year we promised our investors to be after a, a scientific a validation. So we after a third party validation, we gave our information to a professor we're working with. And this year, it's all about putting a machine in the ground and engaging customers. So that's our commitment to our customers right now. And this is why we are so busy and hopefully we'll expand on this. Uh, there is a strong management team. Some of them have been joining from Siemens and we're growing um, every day. We're growing. We just had the CFO, Mina, join us uh, to, uh, and he'll talk a little bit about his background, perhaps when you asked some of the Q and A's and uh, the team is growing organically inside. Most of the team important to say stayed with us for the last uh, seven, eight years, not just that they are intellectually uh, intrigued by what's going on, but they know uh, that they are on something that is very, very different than anything else. Uh, the applications that you see here is the applications that we are developing right now in the lab. Uh, right to left is the renewable oil. This is uh, probably the most efficient system to transfer renewable oil into renewable fuels and specialty chemicals. Uh, we tested it. And you guys will ask, well, how come you know all of this? We'll talk about that. I mean, some of the feedback that we have from organizations is, is fairly clear. Among is, you know, we searched for 100 companies before. How come we never heard of you? So they did the technology validation. In the bitumen section, we are basically uh, improving uh, bitumen. Bitumen is vast used in Canada, but also in refineries. Uh, we take the material that is really, really hard to take. It is the asphaltine and the connection to plastic. We call it asphaltine nature's polymer. And so to your uh, ears, we started doing research on plastics 12 years ago when we commissioned and uh, uh, conceived the company. But then when we turn the asphaltine to something light, we mix it together and we save a lot of the blending material that uh, we've been, uh, you know, that uh, has to be transported. And of course, the subject of the day <clears throat> is hydrochemolytic, uh, the plastic upscaling. This is the most important slide that I'd like to share with you. Uh, basically, it talks about the plastic, but if you think of mass processing of plastic, uh, um, waste plastic, there are different approaches being developed over the years. Left to right, the thermal approach, gasification, pyrosis, if you don't know those names, uh, the one that related to solvent and the one that related to mechanical, all of them have been developed over the years and beneath them, hundreds and hundreds of companies that are uh, really developing some kind of aspects under this approach. And so first and foremost, Aduro is proposing another approach after this long time, Aduro is actually proposing uh, an approach which we call the chemolysis which is the chemical deconstruction, we'll speak about it. And beneath that, Aduro's technology is superior in many ways, in all aspects right now, to the thermal operation. So we use lower energy. We use, we produce higher feedstock. We take feedstock, which is, has much more contaminant than the others. So the others has to be, has to reject a lot of material. We're accepting this material. And the difference is that we're not going directly after the, you know, the hardest of the hardest. We just go after the feedstock that they are rejecting, which is fairly easy for us to process. That immediately tells you about the application that we have, because in a regulatory environment, we can work just beneath these guys. We don't have to work them with them as a competitors. And by the way, some of them are looking at us as partners, and so are we, because if you are working in some environment and you're fighting for the same feedstock, you need to look for way out. And in the last 10 years, uh, there is a bit of realization of how the market will work with the pyrolysis. That's the main approach. And companies are looking for a way out to use lower value feedstock. And we are definitely a candidate for them to look at that. Um, if you know nothing about plastic in general or processing of plastic, you would want to know that uh, you have to put, you know, you, you're putting something in, you take the maximum you can take out and uh, at minimum cost. And here there's an example of us yielding 90% of material that before that was waste, uh, low value, you know, really low value. And just uh, look at the side on the 6% uh, gases, 
uh, half of this is going back to the system to energize it. So it's a very efficient system at a lower capital cost, which means, by the way, because of that, it's highly environmental by itself, but also because we can do what we can do, I tell you before, we can take uh, uh, much more contamination. That means we can put it in remote distance. That means we're also saving a lot of transportations. We're creating uh, those systems. We can do them uh, uh, in remote location. That's a lot of environmental uh, benefit. Um, here uh, is just uh, everyone is talking about circularity. So what does it mean really? Uh, in the process of making plastic, there is a machine called ethylene cracker. Uh, oil that we're producing and, and others are producing is transferred into a material that is later produced plastic with it. When we meet this plastic as waste, we turn it back into this oil that is returned. The material that we are operating on right now is a combination of polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene. By far the uh, largest market is polyethylene and polypropylene. They are the most uh, commonly to use and they are the most hardest to recycle. And the organization that are operating on that on, on this uh, uh, material often has to reject a lot of material because it's, it's a little bit contaminated. Uh, it's create issues with this. Maybe I'll let Mina jump in to talk a little bit about this, the, the financials. And, and there is a little bit more that we can show you later. Uh, yeah. but we'll take it as we go. I wanted to touch base on a couple of things on the prior slides before I jump into this one. So. That slide where Ofer essentially presented uh, the different uh, approaches, right? If you can go back one more slide, Ofer. Uh, this one? Yeah. So I, I just wanted to point, pinpoint the fact that these existing approaches, thermolysis onward, right? All of them together are addressing a very small part of the plastic waste issue, right? In the US last year, I think the most recent number that came out is between six and 8% of plastic waste is being recycled today. What does that tell you? It means that the current landscape, the current way of, of doing things is just not really working to make a major dent in the plastic waste problem. And, and the reason for being is basically everybody in the last 50 years was focused on building this mega scale uh, capacity uh, using technology that has chemical limitations. So they need to reject a lot of those, that waste that comes down the stream because of contaminant, because, you know, it's, you know, too dirty, it's too mixed with other elements, it's just too costly to pre-treat, pre-sort um, before it goes into the process. And their output at the end of the day, because of the lower yield that they get, it's just not economically viable um, at even a very, very large scale. So it tells you that the market as a whole is very ripe for disruption. And we intend, you know, our plan is essentially to rejig the way the whole market functions. And I'll tell you what, what I mean by that when I go back to the slide that we had there. So back to the economic model here essentially what we're building here uh, is a starting uh, commercial scale at 25 tons per day so that comes up to 8.5 thousand tons annually and i'll give you a comparison with legacy technologies they build capacity closer to uh, i want to say 20 to 50 times this scale right so we're talking about 100 thousand tons is really a starting point uh, for most of these legacy technologies they mostly build things closer to four or five hundred thousand tons right so 8.5 compared to four hundred uh thousand tons annually so they're forced to, to build these centralized very large capacity and then what does that mean now to feed that beast they need to get first of all very specific feedstock the cream of the crop they got to chase it farther and farther away so if you're in the middle of the u.s somewhere you're basically importing waste from a whole different, you know, from other countries, surrounding countries across the ocean, just so you have enough feedstock that meets your criteria uh, for what you've built. Uh, so, you know, not only can we address the, the 90 plus percent of waste that is difficult for these legacy technologies, but we can also help these guys uh, improve what they can accept on their end as well. So like Ofer said, we, we see some of them as competitors, but we see most of them as potential partners down the road. So going into the economic model here, um, what you have in front of you is the starting scale of 25 tons per day, and that same reactor unit just gets scaled in a train. So we can build five of them, 10 of them, 20 of them. So we could build capacity in a modular uh, manner, and it doesn't have to all be built at once. It can be, you know, you can start with one and start building capacity as the need arises, right? Um, I'll just jump into the numbers here. It's pretty self-explanatory with OPEX and the revenue expected, but I'll 
I'll end up saying, you know, at, at a starting scale, we expect gross margins to be around 45% with a payback period of around six years. Um, as the equipment scales, you know, we're saving on energy and we're saving on labor. Uh, that gross margin increases above 50% uh, and the payback trends closer to five years. And just so you know, a comparison, these numbers are very, very favorable in comparison to legacy technologies, right? We're, you know, we're, I'd just like to comment, yeah. if you don't mind, uh, one comment there to say that, uh, you know, uh, many of you will may ask, uh, you know, our licensing, we have a licensing model. And so many of the organization that has been, uh, we've been engaged in the last four months already have set up in place. Uh, they are just looking for the right technology to work with. So we, we're not going to go after feedstock, but uh, what we're going to show them is the best technologies out there for them to use. Mm -hmm. They already over the years invested a lot of money in securing and coming with the feedstock. Right now, they're looking to be a, uh, with the strongest technology out there for them. And, and the licensing tech model is, is fit to them uh, like a gloves into the hand. Sorry. Mina, when you're talking about uh, 44 or 50% gross profit margins, you are talking about gross profit margins for the owner of the facility. If you Correct. operate it as a licensing model, that's not your profit margins. This is what you're presenting to somebody that's going to build a facility. Your profit margins are based on licensing and their crazy margins, 80% or something like that, because that's what licensing models are. It would be 100%. There would be no additional cost. We would just be essentially a cash-making machine on, on a Duro side. So yes, on the customer's end, that gross margin would be net of our licensing fee. This is basically our, you know, the profitability that they would make. This is how we would sell them uh, on the on the equipment and the technology, right? But like Ofer mentioned, uh, most people, most of our customer base would be larger organizations. You know, we initially thought that we would be targeting smaller organizations or medium size, um, but we're getting a lot of traction with the larger players that are looking for a, a technology switch, right? They're looking for that next generation. They don't want to have uh, you know, they've committed a lot of capital and they have the feedstock, they have all the components and the only thing that they're missing is the technology, right? Yeah, Our... and, and the angle there, Mina, just to jump in is that uh, in the UN in 2025 made an announcement for his regulatory, most of them uh, announced over the years of the, in 2025, they will announce for their technology expansion. And over the last 10 years, uh, of course, they haven't heard of options other than, you know, the usual thermal approaches. And this is where this has become so distinct and a perfect storm for us. You see, they they were been working uh, to to improve the technologies existing. They have not think about through you know about new approaches. And some of the things that like that we had, and I'm I'm stating them, is that we scout for hundred technologies before we landed. How come we never heard of you guys? Uh, public feedback that you can find out with Brightland says they have not seen. Uh, anything like us uh, in the last 25 years and Brightland is the one of Europe's uh, largest chemical hub hosting many pilots and see Aduro is a pot potential candidate to deal with plastic that is rejected by the big guys basically so the, the for us it's a market opportunity it's a perfect storm nobody wants to be uh, the donkey in the room with the second best technologies and we're definitely a candidate to be one of the best if not the best okay um, so uh, we're getting some questions here and let me can we stay on that slide over my apologies this slide yeah so we're sure. getting some questions from uh, chris here uh okay. with regards to the licensing model um they're asking in detail so we're so chris we're licensing the technology right the actual equipment the reactor it's going to be based on our specs that's what we're scaling right now that's what we're developing uh so it will be a complete package that we deliver to the customer but the the reactors uh, the equipment this is not exotic uh, equipment this is very similar to what's being used uh for legacy approaches and other petrochemical um yes uh, processes right so i want to make sure that that's very understood we're a technology company and we've done all the heavy lifting in the past 12 years to fine tune exactly how this process would work the workflow uh the chemistry the environment Right. And this is very complex, complex stuff. It's not something that it can be easily replicated. Actually, I don't even know if it could be uh, without going through what we've gone through over 12 years and, and all of the all our investments to date. Right. So it would be like a royalty as they process feedstock through their 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 equipment. Let's say there's 10 tons process. We would be getting a cut of that. Right. We would be getting cut of the revenue and it would be that kind of model. 
but there is no special ingredients uh, or uh, special equipment. It's all in the, the chemistry. Um, and that's the best business model in the world because uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a capital intensive business uh, of building these plants, mm -hmm. but somebody else is paying the capital, right? So that's, I mean, your growth is very capital light because somebody else is paying for that. So I just want to make sure that people understand this. That this is like the best business model that you can have. Yeah, some it's capital intensive, but if somebody else pays the capital cost, you know we don't have to pay for it. So, Marish, these these look the petrochemical industry is is very large. These are large companies, and they have the know how to build these projects, right? It's not that we don't have the know how, but they don't really need our assistance in building this large capex projects. Uh, they've done it before using legacy technologies. They have the engineers, they have the site, they have the uh, everything they need really to build this project um, flawlessly, right? We're going to be part of that production, of course, because we are coming in with our technologists, we're chemists, with our engineers as well, supervising and working side by side. But they have the money, the know-how, and everything else they need outside of the technology. So it's a quite an easy um, offtake is what I want to say, right? Now... Having said that, that is our primary focus to work on licensing. But in the future, we are interested in having our own projects, right? This is a very significant gross margin. Fastest way to scale, the fastest way to deliver value is to work through licensing, right? But at some point, we're going to be making more and more revenue. We're going to have cash on hand to have our own projects as well. So it would be terrible to ignore that, that potential as well on our end. This but slide. Domina, just to, to give you context to this, the you know embedded in the technology's ability to eat more contamination that dictate full territory and you know where eighty percent of the market that is not used by the mm -hmm. big boys, so Latin America, India, China, uh, Far East, um, uh, many of the organization, the big organization will not work there because it's not regulated and it's so costly to be there. Well, we can be there with smaller unit and make money. So that, that is the, when Mina says we, why shouldn't we, we should absolutely address uh, this market because this is, uh, we can be there, you know, before everyone else in a smaller unit and a smaller scale. Yeah. But building your own project comes with complexity, it comes with a larger yeah. team, right? So we, you got to build this intelligently and you got to do it. You got to scale as fast as you can uh, through this licensing agreements. And then you go. So we're, we're very focused and disciplined on how to create value uh, year after year. Right. So we're not uh, we take a very focused approach. Right. And we understand the risk of each angle or each approach that we uh, we intend on, on doing. So both models are on the table. Hence the slide showing a side by side comparison between licensing and own and operated. Uh, you'll see the revenue number of owned and operated is significantly higher. And that's just the, the matter of, you know, all the revenues coming on our books versus licensing. We're just taking the licensing, uh, the, the royalty of the licensing fee. Right, hence why the ro the revenue is smaller. That is pretty much it, just the mechanics of it all. I won't dive into these numbers. I think they're self-explanatory. What I do want to say is this model assumes that we're chasing the same feedstock, that cream of the crop that everybody else is chasing. That uh, waste is actually quite expensive in the marketplace because everybody's looking for it. Right, that less than ten percent of that waste is basically it's clean, it's sorted. It works perfectly with legacy approaches and, and equipment. It doesn't clog anything. They don't have any trouble operating on that waste. Everybody's looking for it. Hence why the price of that waste, it, it starts going to, you know, right now around $200, $250 a ton. And there's still an increased competition. So that market is evolving. And that waste is actually getting more expensive by the day, right? So we've plugged in a, um, a dollar per ton of around 200 in this model. But our intention is to work on everything else that is rejected, right? So we expect to be paying uh, for that feedstock if we're operating our own machinery. Of course, licensing, they already have their feedstock. But if we're opening or operating our own machinery, we're aiming something closer to $50, if not less. You know, In some cases, the material is going to be so complex where it has no other option. So we would essentially, be, essentially get paid by uh, you know, the customer or the person that has the feedstock to take it off their hand. It has to go to the landfill, which is costly. It has to be shipped from point A, B, and C. Uh, so there's a lot of margin to be added to these numbers that you see in front of you. But we didn't want to really dive into all of that complications uh, using, uh, you know, just this illustration. So I just wanted to make that point clear. Can I run through the other one? Yeah, please. 
So I, I, I'll, run, I'll skip this slide uh, and I'll, I'll speak about uh, this. This slide is six months old and when it was, it was uh, in the length of the six months when we show it. Um, this is uh, just an example of interest, global interest um, that we received uh, up to six to eight uh, months ago uh, where uh, we've been, uh, I'll say, with a website and been presenting in conferences um for for i guess uh, probably probably once or twice uh, a month in a conference so not a lot of activity but yet uh, global interest uh, from organization uh, worldwide and uh, these numbers are already older there is more companies when we started the the journey we uh, kind of a thought we'll we'll start small and so b2b business to business basically because the units are small we could sell them to uh, a local organization that otherwise cannot doesn't need to throw this into the land stream they will just share profit with them and uh, they are the owners of the waste and in the last uh, four or five months, we got overwhelmed by interest from the big boys. We got absolutely took the oxygen from the room. So our attention now is just service uh, these guys at this point of time. Our focus is, as I mentioned, is uh, two things. One of them in this year to uh, uh, build a machine in the ground. And I'll talk a little bit about this demo unit. And the other one is to engage customers. And we are uh, well on our path on both. And the demo unit is not a demo unit just to come and drink coffees. We just stipulate a lot that uh, customers are looking for way out for the inflation of the feedstock, and we are candidate to do so. So the demo unit is basically where customers will come to us. They will, uh, 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 we will test their feedstock. We will show them different type of feedstock. They will do troubleshooting. It's a, a three, four months period time where they're taking all of this for them to orient it, to understand what is the capability of the system. So. It's a, a customer engagement program that we're starting now. So when we will become uh, with a commercial unit available, the licensing model will just went in and that's how we see. So we're efficiently trying to efficient every minute uh, from now until 2025, where we see our first unit. Ultimately, you know, Ofer mentioned right now that we're in discussions or we've gotten a lot of inbound interest from significant players, right? So yes, there is interest as well, you know, for us to be, I don't want to say taken advantage of, but you, you need to have the leverage uh, as you approach these discussions with these players, right? Everybody wants to essentially take, they want to almost take too much out of a company of our size, right? So, and we want them to be competing against us. We don't want to be, um, how you do can you say tell that? them that you don't like to be hugged unless you, yeah. I mean, this is a terminology that, that Ofer uses, you know, we, we essentially want to, we want to deal with this in a very strategic manner. Um, there's a lot of interest globally uh, to adopt technologies like ours. Um, so yes, is there a potential down the road that we have a stronger strategic partnership with a large uh, name out there? It's, it's always a potential. Uh, right now we're in discussions with a lot of people, so we're not committing to anything, right? And that is a strategic move from our end. We understand how disruptive our technology is, how globally uh, impactful it is. Uh, so we need to be very careful not to prematurely get engaged and and, and harm the long term for, for ourselves and our shareholders as well. Okay. But ultimately, I want you to look at this chart as year one to year five, right? So year one starting from you know today, let's say. So in, in 2022, um, we are going to have our, our first pilot reactor for plastics uh, in the lab, continuous flow. That machine is going to be run like for several months extensively uh, so we can optimize the design and of the uh, the tonnage per day uh, semi-commercial unit for next year. Um, so I, I want to say we're we're already working on parallel. So we're not only working on the continuous flow; we're working on the design for the semi-commercial. We already have some elements working on the commercial unit for 2025. But you know, every scale needs to be worked extensively and operated um, to find to troubleshoot, right? So this is just the way how you scale technology uh, from one point to the other. And I want to make it clear that there's only really three points of scale, right? We're already at the point number one, which is continuous flow, uh, mimics uh, how a commercial unit would work. Point number two is a semi-commercial uh, unit, which would be tons per day. And, and we're aiming anywhere between two and four tons per day. The next stage is our commercial unit, which is 25 tons per day. Now, the great thing of having a technology like ours that essentially is creating inbound interest, we're not chasing customers. They're essentially chasing us 
is that we start building that commercial pipeline today, right? We're working with them on the continuous flow reactor in the lab. We'll be working with them as well on the semi-commercial unit. Some of them are potentially gonna come in as partners at that stage as well. But more importantly, we're solidifying our pipeline for 2025 when we're gonna roll out these commercial units. It's gonna become more of a certainty significantly earlier than that. So, you know, the market, shareholders, uh, industry, they're not gonna be waiting uh, until then to know what's coming across the finish line here. That will be predetermined. Some of it is gonna be actually in the works, right? In terms of uh, site selection, uh, the size, the feedstock, all of that stuff is going to be predetermined as we start commissioning and deploying commercial units by year three, as you show here, right? And year three, this is a, an inflection point for us where we are, first of all, break even. We're a significantly larger organization with footprints across three continents. We expect to have um, operating hubs outside of Canada. Um, we're aiming for different jurisdictions, uh, potentially five in the next three years. Some of them is going to, they're going to happen earlier than, than later, but by year three, we expect them to be fully operational. And at that point, we're just replicating, right? When you're in replication mode, it becomes very easy to start delivering tremendous value and for analysts coverage, uh, the market to really get confidence on how you're in your year. And that's where really, um, you know, significant concrete models are built at that stage. Um, and then, you know, I'm only showing year five in this in this uh, slide, but year six essentially looks like the same growth from four to five, five to six onwards. Actually, the growth is increasing because of the hubs that we mentioned in year three. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, before, we, yeah, before we finish and enter the slide, uh, the questions, a, a comment to say that uh, when we build this model, we were thinking small scale uh, unit sales by, you know, in, in different territories. Uh, essentially, the customers that we are dealing and willing right now, each one of them could take us to home run to this type of, uh, of uh, licensing model and finish the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, so this is, uh, we're talking about, some, we've been starting with small projects, but um, right now the size of the project is significantly increased. Correct. And that's, that's a very important point, you know, only. You know, the, the scale of the customers that we have were discussions, and of course, these are only discussions, just to be 100% upfront here. Um, very fruitful discussions, very exciting discussions, but that's where they are currently. But only one of these customers, actually several of them are at the scale that they would essentially hit our, our year five target on their own, right? This model depicts 12 different projects by year five at a smaller scale, because that was our vantage point when we built this earlier this year. You know, all the people that were in discussions with her were more to the, you know, one to, to five reactor, anywhere between 25 tons to 300 tons a day. Those were the discussions we're having. Um, now our discussions are with companies that are potentially, you know, hundreds of thousands of tons. Are you, are you saying that, and I know there are discussions, are you saying that one big client could make your company be able to generate $95 million of revenues? Is this what you're saying? Correct. That's the potential that we're working on. Now, I don't think we shave off of these years. I mean, it might be happening earlier than later, but I mean, this is a five-year forecast, right? So you have to take it with uh, with that vantage point. I mean, nobody can really predict the the future that far ahead with with any significant certainty. Uh, but the model that we've built here in our opinion, was something that we wanted to build in a conservative manner. Uh, and we worked from the variables that we had at the time, right, which is very concrete. You know, So each one of these, it's not driven by potential tonnage. It's driven by which customer do we think is going to be locked in at what point and what tonnage have they mentioned to us uh, physically, and we build it from there. It's not really a, a hypothetical high level. So if we were to replace those 12 customers with only one that we're in discussions with right now, they could potentially surpass our year year five target on their own. That that's how big the tonnage um, they process is. So and yeah. and uh, I guess before we go move on to the question, Milos, uh, the, uh, why what's the motivation? So 2025 again is the year of expansion. These these companies are looking to you know uh, this is why it's so important for us to be ready at that time. These customers are looking for the best of the best technology to lead it. Absolutely, we are a candidate to do that. And so they are already thinking for the last 10 years, committing capital costs, committing resources, 
and and feed, securing feed so to this type of expansion and just so you know like every manufacturer out there is under the gun there's a lot of pressure on them to commit significant capital and to really promote recycled material so all the major players from the pepsis of the world to everybody below that there's hundreds of them at that size and scale you know they started with commitments anywhere between 10 20 percent recycled material in their uh, in their packaging or in their uh, uh, anything that they use and a lot of them are starting to up it towards 50 percent right so 50 well, percent yeah the motive, sorry to the, the motivation is to sell you back product that there is component of recyclable material in it they want to come out and says yeah. you know you you buy this plastic coca-cola bottle 50 percent of it or 20 percent of it is recyclable so you, you know it's a yeah it's fairly just like the renewable and it's a journey that is taking really significant uh, turns right now yeah so it's, I mean, it's, a, it's a good marketing for them right it's, it's a marketing absolutely message. absolutely yeah. this is and why, look, why the, plastic has such a bad rap right like it's just it's in everything we touch has plastic in it or you know so yeah. it, the problem globally is 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 so significant beyond anybody's imagination and people think we're actually making a dent we're not you know the the plastic that's out there is literally climbing like this every year there's significantly more out there than people think it's not even stable it's literally like an upward it's growing uh right now we're at a market cap uh if we were to look at the latest number sub 30 million dollars Canadian uh insiders own 48 percent of the company uh we have actually been accumulating uh you know this is a very significant insider ownership uh if you were to see other companies but having said that we understand the value that we are potentially to unlock in the short and medium term here so we're trying to signal as much as we we can that we're 100 percent behind this company its future uh we are very aligned with shareholders and more importantly you know, we we know the value that, uh, you know, we're a public company, so the market dictates reality at any stage, right? But if we were to compare our company with other comparatives out there publicly and privately, um, we are very much undervalued. Uh, the stock is quite inexpensive, but we understand the background as well is the fact that the market is choppy. There's a lot of fear outside and we're very much undiscovered. So what we're what we've committed to recently is to get the story out there. But more importantly, we're also on the road constantly, right? We just came back from Montreal Capital Events Conference. We had tremendous meetings with uh, very significant players out there. Um, so I think we're getting traction. I think we're getting the word out there. We hate that we remain a little bit undiscovered. Could be an opportunity for some, but we're tirelessly working around the clock to make that uh, make that change, right? We want to be a household name. We want everybody to know what we're doing. And we want them to more importantly to follow how we execute management and offer his philosophy is is very key we under promise over deliver and we're transparent with people uh, and investors on how we're doing this so they can understand what it means to execute and what because it can be confusing because we're working in a complex sector and industry but we want everybody to listen to the story to be 100 percent aware of what to expect um and when to expect it right so the worst thing is to have somebody engage and slowly get frustrated or, or, or impatient because they think we should, you know, we, we have, we get some of that, you know, people that think in, in two months we'll have, uh, you know, 10 commercial units out there. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, we can't help that. We can only educate as much as we can. The opportunity here is an immense opportunity, but it requires these steps to go through and, and we're diligently working around the clock. And I want to say these people that are working in the company, in the lab, more importantly than, than in management, they've been with the company for a very, very long time these guys are subject matter experts uh they could go anywhere they want they would be worth their weight in gold uh you know based on their backgrounds they stick with this because they know what we're trying to build and what we're trying to create here uh so uh, as much as you yeah. understand that it's going to help you really be able to quantify this opportunity and make your own decisions as it works for you i hope you enjoyed this presentation by the ceo and cfo and as i said at the beginning of this video the next video, which I will post tomorrow, will be more about the chemistry and it will include those same individuals plus Anil, who's the chief scientist. But also, if you, you probably noticed that they were re referred a few times to a Q&A, a questions and answers session. And there will be a separate video on just questions and their answers. So 
don't think that you missed anything. It's just, it will be a separate video because otherwise each of these videos would simply be way too long.